All right. Um, it's great to be here and I appreciate the opportunity and the uh, very nice setting here in Sun River. I put, I, I said I was going to talk about, um, I'm going to talk about electron transfer simulations in solution, but um, this is really a part of a bigger effort in my group to understand and tame quantum mechanics. And uh, we heard quite a bit about quantum mechanics already. Quantum mechanics is hard. Um, it's also very subtle. We have a time dependent Schrodinger equation that gives us the evolution of the wave function. In terms of that, we can obtain anything we want. And um, it has all kinds of peculiar features. If we look at the atomic scale, single atom, molecule, then we see all these fascinating effects like quantum interference and coherence and tunneling and entanglement and all those things that we love to talk about. At the same time, if we look on the macroscopic scale, condensed phase systems, lots of atoms together, what we observe is typically incoherent behavior, classical laws, classical behavior. And um, so it's really very interesting and a very inter intricate um, behavior and a very interesting question how this works, how this happens. If we want to solve the Schrodinger equation to simulate the system, then the um, computational effort appears to scale exponentially with a number of particles and say, a, say appears because it is obvious that if we want to, to get a wave function, that's a function of all the coordinates and obviously you need to put um, an exponential amount of work to get the exponential amount of information in the many body wave function, but maybe there are other ways around if that's not what you need to target if you want to target an observable. I was very um, pleased to see that uh, NSF is uh, making quantum mechanics and the quantum leap um, a priority topic at the frontier of our efforts for the 21st century. And um, what we need to do here is um, two things. We need to understand processes, but to understand processes we need simulation tools. So we need to, to develop novel simulation tools that avoid, hopefully, this, con this exponential scaling and are applicable to many body quantum processes. At the same time, though, as these tools are going to let us help us understand many body processes, at the same time, understanding the many body processes in quantum mechanics could help us develop better tools. In other words, we could maybe use the physics that we understand to guide our methods to converge and give us the right answer without introducing approximations. And going back and forth between those two goals, I think, is what we need to focus on and what, what we try to do here. So I said exponential behavior here. The, the exponential behavior is obvious from the Schrodinger equation. There's another formulation of quantum mechanics that is local, does not use wave functions, and therefore might be attractive for possibly, potentially, circumventing the exponential scaling. That's Feynman's pathological approach, and I'm not going to spend much time discussing this. Many of you are familiar with it. It says the amplitude is a sum, it's a sum of amplitudes along all paths that the particle can take, and paths are just like trajectories. They are local. They are x versus t, that, this kind of thing. You don't have to store wave functions at all anywhere in this formulation. This formulation contains all the essence of quantum mechanics here in this sum. This is a sum of complex numbers. So the idea of quantum superposition, interference, everything is in this, in this sum. So um, at the same time, computationally, this sum is extremely difficult to obtain because if you imagine, first of all, it's an infinite sum usually because the number of paths is infinite. But if you go and discretize space and time, as we all do when we do simulation, what you find is you have this lattice of x versus t. And what you need to do is find all the paths that, that live on this lattice that connect the initial and the final point. And what you see very easily is the number of paths grows like the number of spatial grid points you would use to a power that's equal to a number of time steps. And you get exponential growth here with space, with a number of particles, as well as time in the pattern of formulation. So you might say, what's good about this? And there's some things, lots of things that are good about this that I'm going to talk about. But very quickly, just to mention that when you get these kinds of sums, that are astronomical sums, you often resort to Monte Carlo methods, stochastic sampling, because you cannot evaluate them otherwise. And that's a wonderful way, except it doesn't work here. It doesn't work for the real-time path integral because of the sign problem. The sign problem is what you get when you try to, to, to sample randomly a function that oscillates like crazy between positive and negative. And there's so much structure in the function that unless you account for those, for those positive and negative regions very accurately, very in a lot of detail, you cannot really get anything meaningful. You get just noise. Results are buried in noise. Now, 
the um, time evolution operator that gives us quantum dynamics looks very similar to the Boltzmann operator. They're both exponential, so the Hamiltonian. Um, the Boltzmann operator has a real exponent. Time evolution has an imaginary exponent. And that makes a huge difference. And many of you are working on equilibrium path integral methods for equilibrium properties. And what you know is you can you get these uh, kinds of pictures of necklaces and so on. You can sample this kind of thing very, very well, very efficiently by Monte Carlo methods. So unless you have fermions, many identical fermions, this is a very feasible problem, very, very um, computationally efficient problem compared to quantum dynamics where you get a massive sign problem even if you don't have fermions in your system. So what's the pragmatic approach for now for many systems? Many processes, what you have is a subsystem is fully quantum mechanical. You might have an electron transfer pair. You might have a proton tunneling coordinates, these kinds of things that must be treated by quantum, by quantum mechanics, but the rest of the world could be the atoms of a liquid, could be a biological molecule, could safely be treated by classical trajectories. So you'd like to do a combined quantum classical simulation, and that sounds fantastic, that would resolve our problem here. Unfortunately, this is not easy, or it's not actually very sound, a very sound way to do things, because quantum, qu quantum mechanics is delocalized. You've got wave functions. At the same time, classical mechanics is a local theory. A trajectory wants to know the force at every point. So when you try to go to evaluate the force on a trajectory, what's the contribution of the force from the uh, quantum degree of freedom? Well, where should you evaluate the force? If the quantum degree of freedom has a wave function split, has two lobes or multiple lobes, as happens all the time when you have reactions, then where should you evaluate the force? And the only way to resolve this is to say to take the average force that's known as the Ehrenfest model. And um, it's like mean field theory. And very often in this, the many situations where mean field theory is great, of course, here it is not good, does not work. Instead of giving you two different products, it's going to give you one product moving on the average potential surface. And this is a well-known problem. It's been uh, around for many decades, and there have been lots of efforts to overcome this problem, develop simulation methods that are quantum classical that don't have this problem and give you something sensible. So what we'd like to do is do this without approximations, without introducing any approximations or assumptions. So here's what we're going to do. It's very simple, actually. You see, the uh, dilemma is that classical mechanics is local, quantum mechanics is non-local. But if instead of wave functions, I use the path integral formula formulation of quantum mechanics, then everything is local. A path is local, like a trajectory. And paths, quantum paths, talk to classical trajectories in a unique and unambiguous way without any averaging. So this leads us to the quantum classical path integral we formulated a few years back, which is very simple. It's actually fully derivable, but I'm going to say it, I'm going to summarize it in two sentences here. What we do is, for the few quantum degrees of freedom, we are going to sum over all the paths, all the quantum paths. And for the many classical degrees of freedom, we are going to sum, to, to sum over classical paths only. That's it. And now the forces between quantum and classical particles are unambiguously determined because there is no need for any kind of averaging. So and as I said, this is fully derivable. It's not just um, a statement that I'm just making. You can just obtain this expression. And here's the expression you obtain. So and, and, um, my apologies here for writing um, an equation here. I'm going to try to not be too technical. Let's say I've tried to get a population or, a or density matrix, reduced density matrix. What I have to do is I need to sample the um, initial conditions of the uh, classical particles, the classical trajectories. So I'm going to do a phase space average here. I'm going to have some probability distribution to sample, for, to sample from. And then I'm going to do a sum over all the quantum paths there are. And I'm going to be adding quantum amplitudes. The quantum amplitudes are amplitudes that come from the interaction between quantum and classical degrees of freedom in the form of a phase. So we have this massive phase here. There's nothing else but a phase. And this works um, in a very interesting way. The quantum path, the quantum particle, drives the classical trajectories, the classical solvent, by providing a sequence of forces at the trajectories of the solvent experience. And the classical trajectories of the solvent along the trajectory, what we get is we get a, a quantum mechanical phase that is given by an action integral. And um, that phase alters the quantum mechanical amplitude of the quantum system. And that's the, the interaction between quantum and classical particles. So everything, all the interactions is, is in this phase right here. So everything, all the correlations are included exactly. 
everything comes, all the interactions are in this phase, and this phase, when it's average over all the classical particles, gives rise to decoherence, and that's what decoherence the amplitude of the system. So decoherence arises naturally, naturally here, there is no reason to, no, um, no need for putting in any external, external decoherence factors or anything like that. Everything, all the effects are in this expression. But of course, trying to evaluate this is awful numerically because we need to sum over all the quantum paths. And we just saw a few minutes ago, the number of quantum paths grows exponentially with time. So even if my quantum particle is a very, quantum subsystem is a very small one, imagine a case of just two states, for instance, if I'm modeling a, an electron transfer reaction, I've got a donor and the acceptor, so I've got two states for the system. What happens is, um, at every time step my calculation, the number of states doubles of the system because the system if it starts in the, say, in the donor state, after one step can be donor or acceptor, after another step donor or acceptor, donor or acceptor, like that, so you have this tree. And the branches of a tree double, um, ex grow exponentially with the propagation time. So if I want to, to simulate a, re a reaction for 1,000 time steps, I've got two, it's actually not two, it's two square, because the density matrix, I've got two square four to the 1,000 power quantum paths. And each of those quantum paths specifies a different classical trajectory. So I've got this number of trajectories, and of course, in addition to this, I need to, to average up initial conditions. So you see that this is not just, this is not gonna be feasible just as I'm writing it. Avogadro's number is nothing in comparison to these kinds of things. All right, so, and Monte Carlo methods fail, as we um, already saw, because of the oscillatory nature of the integrand. This is just, the integral is just a phase, nothing else. So it's really very, uh, a very nasty job here. So we, um, um, what can we do here? The idea is we are going to try and understand the physics and have the physics guide our calculation and disentangle this sum into something we can handle. So we go to lower this exponent by many, many, um, or this magnitude, actually, several orders, orders of magnitude to be able to do it, to make the, the calculation doable. So um, we went back and thought a lot about this. We've been thinking about this problem for a long time. And we went back and, and tried to understand the mechanism of, uh, mechanism of decoherence. So what I mean by this, if I only have the um, isolated subsystem, the molecule, the two-level the, uh, two system, whatever, that is fully quantum mechanical, exhibits full quantum coherence, so that's this part of our expression, just the amplitude of the system, nothing else, that's fully coherent, but somehow when I take this and immerse it in, a sol in solution, in a solvent or biological medium, the medium decoheres the dynamics. Okay, turns this into that. How does this work? So I'm gonna make a long story short here and tell you there are two contributions basically to this decoherence, to decoherence processes, and one of them is uh, what I call classical decoherence, a classical contribution, and um, you can um, understand it, can explain it in terms of uh, processes that correspond to stimulated absorption and emission of phonons. If the sol if the environment were to be a solid, we'd talk about phonons, it's this kind of thing. So we get stimulated absorption and emission of phonons, and um, we call this a classical mechanism because stimulated as opposed to the quantum mechanism of decoherence. And by the way, you can Oh, I'm not gonna do this, just give me a step. All right, small bit, little video here, all right. The next one. Um, so this is, uh, the other mechanism of decoherence is a quantum mechanism, which um, proceeds via spontaneous emission of phonons. That's why I call it quantum mechanical decoherence. And this is, this is the tougher part. The classical decoherence is easy to deal with, and we do that, we try to take advantage of everything we can here to lower the uh, computational cost and by many orders of magnitude. So this quantum decoherence has to do with what we call, in chemistry, we call the back reaction. This is a fact that you have to use all the different paths of the quantum particle, otherwise you're not getting the right answer. Classical decoherence, you can get away with using a single trajectory. It's actually very nice physics here. This is all very analogous to the physics of absorption and emission of light and I don't have the time to go into detail. But since we need to use the entire, all the sum of all the paths here, the paths have, uh, the number of paths grows, of course, exponentially with time, and uh, it's the phase in, uh, along an entire path that's important. So this means, this gives rise to what we call quantum memory. So we get quantum memory here that needs to be accounted for correctly, all of it. 
otherwise you wouldn't get the right answer. So in, um, in a few um, sentences, what we do is the following. We try to pre-treat the classical decoherence that's easy by comparison, that's a single trajectory. We take that, we, we feed the information from that into our expression, the path integral, the propagators, trying to incorporate all this, and that gives us a um, that, that gives us a way to capture the bulk of decoherence, actually. That's the bulk of decoherence is of classical nature. And then we perform the sum over all the paths. We need to do that. But because um, that's a huge sum, we cannot really do that as is. However, we have noticed and we can, we can prove that the quantum memory does not live forever. No memory lives forever, typically in typical systems. So it's finite, that's short-lived, finite-lived. So that allows us to implement iterative decomposition to the sum, and that makes a calculation possible. It also makes it scale linearly with propagation time. In addition, there are other things. Decoherence and interference also works in our favor in other ways, and I have some, um, a few ideas here. Um, that I'm not going to talk about in detail. So after all this, we have an efficient methodology, quantum classical, wh where we've introduced no approximations. It's a, once it's converged, it gives us the full quantum classical answer. There is no sign problem, as I said, because we do the sums exactly de um, de by deterministic methods, where, where there are phase factors. It scales li linearly with propagation time. Um, it scales like an MD method, molecular dynamics, as a function of the, of the number of particles, and is fully parallelizable and is ideal for blue waters, and this could not have been possible without blue waters. So let me show you what we have done. So this is, um, this is our first simulation, in fact, of an electron transfer reaction in solution. We've got the uh, ferrocin ferrocinium self-exchange electron transfer reaction and the uh, electron goes from this one to that one. In, and this is in solution, this was in liquid hexane. Since then, we've done a number of simulations in other solvents. And um, we have uh, a simulation cell that includes over 1,300 atoms. They're all interacting via charm force fields. These are fully inharmonic uh, force fields. There's no assumption about the interactions, nothing at all. And we do the full calculation here. Once we converge, we get the um, the full QCPI result. So here are some convergence curves you see here. The ones we converge, this is pretty much converged here, that's our result. And um, effectively, with all these decompositions that involve no adjustable parameters, no assumptions, effectively, effectively we have included this number, it's 2 to the 400 power times 10,000 initial conditions, this number of trajectories. Right? Well, clearly we did not enumerate, they would not sum explicitly over this number of trajectories, right? But effectively, that's what's in the calculation. And all these trajectories here, 2 to the 400 power trajectories, they all come in with phases, and their phases interfere, right? And that's quantum interference. Um, this is, I believe, this is the first of its kind. This is the most accurate simulation, I believe, there's been of an electron transfer reaction that includes everything without any assumptions. And this was done on blue waters. What you see here is a picture, a snapshot of our simulation. So from an each initial condition, we get many, many, many trajectories of a solvent to, to grow. And um, along each of these trajectories, we get the phases, right? So what you see here is a snapshot of just three of those trajectories that developed after one initial condition after some time. And what you see is, it looks like the atoms are splitting. They're not splitting. They're just different, traje different locations of the atoms along different trajectories. So what you see here is a quantum delocalization effect on the classical solvent. It spills over from a quantum degree of freedom into the class all to the, uh, to the classical particles and get um, the localization and phase coherence and phase interference among the uh, classical particles. Okay, so here's my summary. QCPI is a rigorous methodology, includes zero point energy, all the interference, all the coherence, everything is automatically included, the tail balance is satisfied, and um, it, it's characterized by MD scaling, fully parallelizable, and um, it is becoming, I think, a, a powerful tool in simulation because you don't need to make any assumptions. So, oops, here. So this is um, a picture of my group, actually, about two years ago, it's old, I need to update the picture. These are the people who uh, contributed the work, and Tom Allen was a former 
uh, Blue Waters Graduate Fellow. Peter Walters was a person who probably made most of the advances here and did the um, charge transfer simulation I showed. He's not a Miller Fellow at UC Berkeley. And um, this was fund has been funded by NSF, and this would not have been possible without the um, uh, simulation tool that we got with Blue Waters, and this is, this is it, so thank you so much.